the first stage to all of this is getting used to the fact that I can hear myself talk and like spending the 30 seconds I need to adjust to that. Um, cause you get that real time audio feedback, which is how I know that the first two minutes of the last recording, uh, was slowly falling apart on my other computer, which is why we switched, which is why the audience is now being informed that they've missed two incredible minutes, probably the best minutes of this <laughs> recording ever. They have now missed it. They'll never get it back. The next 50 minutes will never compare to the very first two minutes of that of that failed recording process. <laughs> so to all the fans out there, I am incredibly sorry. My name is Jesse Anderson from Quackalope. I am joined today with Cole Worley, the uh, designer of Root and Oath and and Pax Premier and John Company, um, a, a incredible designer who I honestly didn't expect to say yes to the interview as quickly and enthusiastically as he did. Thank you for joining me, sir. You caught me in a moment of weakness, but I'm equally glad to be here. Thanks. You are you are currently locked at home with with family and children, and you don't mind seeing a, a stranger's face for a moment. Is that the? <laughs> no, that, that's exactly it. I mean, I went to drop off my computer at a repair shop the other day and found myself just small talking in a way that I've never wanted to small talk in my life. And we 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 just chatted for an hour about nothing. Uh, you know, at the at the six f- feet divide, of course. But it was it was clear that we were just both missing the company of people we didn't know. Sure. That's fair. Now, leaning into that, I I was previously telling me that there is no possible way you remember the very first time we we came across each other um, because it would have been only something that I would have remembered. I went to uh, PAX Unplugged, I think about two years ago, about three months before I, I officially started and launched anything on Quackalope as – uh, a kid who wanted to do a board game channel thing, didn't know much about board games, literally knew about nothing. I just knew that I liked them, uh, knew a significant amount about media and ran around the convention hall with a few different cameras trying to do some interviews and picking up games that were popular at the time. And it happens. I stumbled across the leader games booth, uh, saw the adorable artwork on the front, didn't know much about root. I knew people, I knew it was popular. Um, and I, I said something along the lines of the same thing that I was saying to most of the booths, like, hi, I'm Jesse. I'm I'm doing a thing called Quackalope. You don't know what that is, but you will one day. Uh, <laughs> tell me about your game. And came along the lines of, I, I think you, at some point I asked, at some point I asked a question that led to you just very politely saying, oh yeah, no, I, I, I made this. Like, this is, this is mine. We only have one or two copies left. And I, I left with one of those last one or two copies from one of the very early print runs, which came back to bite me about two years later when I played a game on the channel and I had a majority of your fan base inform me that not only I got all of the rules wrong, but I also was playing on the outdated boards and I should have taken the time to update them. So uh, I'm not sure if that's my fault or your fault. I, it's a, we'll, we'll split the blame on that one. Okay. <laughs> so... I have a mix of questions from the community here. Um, I was just telling you that the majority of my fan base, I'm pretty convinced, is just your fan base uh, watching me. Um, so I figured we'd go through the we'd go through a mix of those. I do have a few questions that I want to pose before we get into sort of the nitty gritty and, and walk through that conversation. Uh, the first question, let me see if I can find who asked it here. The first question is going to be. Do you think Jesse will ever be able to play a game of Root live on camera without getting a significant amount of the rules wrong? I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Uh, I have not been able to do this myself, so you're you're in the clear. Don't I? Or rather, I I don't know if it's possible. I mean, I think part of it, it is not the fault of Root. Well, it is the fault of Root, but it's also the fault of just the weird feeling of playing a game on a camera. Where there are so many things in your mind, I like am so far away from being able to play a game well, let alone like remembering all the bits. I've gotten close the past couple of games, but I did play on one of the company's streams, the game is the Eerie, where I went into turn one turmoil, which is incredibly embarrassing. Uh, and then I think I, I had like three or four turmoils that game. Uh, so I don't know if there's much hope for you, but th- there's not much hope for any of us. I, I, will, I will take whatever I can get because... Uh, we we have tried, and we're now we're now resigned to the fact that our how to plays are reasonably accurate. Our game plays are are fun, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, so along with that, all right. The second second question I have, I'd love to hear what is currently in the pipeline, um, whether it's for you personally, and then also for Leader Games. Um, what is what is the day and age looking like? 
So we're, uh, you know, like a lot of companies, we kind of like have, have had to transition to this weird uh, remote working system. Uh, and right now it, we're, we're trying our best to have it not upend our processes. Like we have a lot of games. I mean, so this is a weird, this is a weird crisis to live through in a publishing company because publishing companies always work like a year. They have a year out horizon or an 18 month horizon. So the things we're working on now are things people are going to have in a year. So we're, we're weirdly uh, detached from the day-to-day troubles. Um, we know they're going to impact us, um, but we have to kind of like bite our lip and just kind of keep moving. So right now on the back end, we are in the like hot and heaviest part of Oath's development. The game is very close to being done in terms of the design. So um, for instance, we're having a big argument about right now about whether or not like how the focus is being reset and like exactly what the action counts are over the course of the game, which is getting the long arguments about whether or not a number should be three or four is basically where, where the core design is. And then on the content side, um, basically all the cards have been designed and many have been through four or five design iterations. So we're, we are getting clo- very close to the level of polish for like very final balancing. And we're building purposely like wonky decks and trying to really push the system. So that's where the back end is. And we're maybe about a month or two from being completely done with the game. Um, outside of that, we have Fort on the boat. It will be arriving, or not, wait, it's not on the boat. It's in production right now. It'll be on the boat soon, uh, and it should be ar- arriving in early summer um, or even late late spring, and we'll have pre-orders up for that. And uh, we were able to show it off recently, and it just looks, it looks so good. It was so fun, I think, for all of us to work on a smaller box game um, just because it's, it's a different kind of constraint, different form factor. It's cuter in a lot of, like, very basic ways. Um, and, uh, Nick Brockman, the games developer did an excellent job. And it's been so fun to watch that game sort of grow. I mean, right when Nick first started, uh, at the job, when we were working on vast and mysterious manner, I had a copy of SPQF and we would play it during lunch and we both liked it. And I, and I think it, it took a while for us to bring the whole studio around to the game, but we just kind of kept playing it and kept enjoying it. And it's been so fun to sort of see that little seed grow into this into this game. I mean, we'll have tons of copies of it soon. So we've got that going on. And then we have a bunch of stuff on the horizon. Um, I'm working on some more root content. Patrick's working on a really cool space game. We've got some more secret stuff that we're working on. We're kind of all over the place. And then pretty in about a month or two, uh, or in a few months, we're going to sit down and actually figure out what our schedule is going to look like next year. But, you know, as ever, we are just doing doing that um, that prospecting on what kind of designs we want to work on. But for folks who like the kinds of stuff that we've done in the past, you're going to find a lot more to like in the next couple of years. Yeah, that's that's the exciting thing is if you're familiar with Vast, if you're familiar with Root, and then you kind of started checking out Oath, I, my ta- my main talking point, one of the main points I told people was, it feels like a leader games game. Like there is a there's a flavor you all have established that if you're into that, if the community, if you if you're part of that family already, you kind of know what to expect when it comes out of your development house. Um, right. And and I'm I'm kind of excited for what's coming down the road. I have had the chance. Jan and I have both have had the chance to play test uh, for at conventions before mm-hmm. um, before the season was over, and and both had a had a great time with it. I'm really excited to see kind of. Uh, how it how it develops and gets to that final stage. Um, I'm I'm really looking forward. Could you run me through? Because I think you'll be better at talking about the mechanics of it. Sure. Could you run me through an overview of just a very brief overview of what Ford is and what people can expect when it when it comes to pre-orders? Sure. So Ford is a deck. It's a deck builder. Uh, that's the easiest way to describe it. But it's about the strangest deck builder you've ever played. So uh, for one. Um, it's a deck builder without a market. There's no market of cards that you're buying from. Instead, the parts of your hand that you're not using are kind of up for auction, essentially. It's incredibly and frustrating. It, it's incredibly frustrating. Uh, and the whole thing is themed around kids building uh, forts out in the woods and or you know around their houses or whatever. And the uh, I love the thematic hook here because the friends that you're not hanging out with, those are the ones who are most liable to go join the other groups. Right. So the, the, there's a little bit of like social social management happening, but essentially it, it's a, it's a deck builder where you are stealing each other's decks. 
Um, and it also it uses a, a leader follow mechanism similar to games like um, Race for the Galaxy, Glory to Rome. Um, so you will w when you play cards out of your deck, you will give actions to the rest of the table and they'll get to do things too. So it's an incredibly interactive deck builder. Um, doesn't have very many rules. I mean, I, I usually think about it as being, um, you know, it's more complicated than Dominion. But it's much less complicated than than root, and it has a lot of good interaction. So for, for, for a deck builder, and it, it, it's it's totally its own its own animal. But one thing that we liked about it is when we were playing it, it had the right balance of um, strong a strong thematic sense of itself, uh, meaningful interaction, and kind of interesting mechanism that we just really like as a studio. And so the more we, we played it, the more we just wanted more people to be able to play this game. Uh, it was designed outside of the studio, I should say that too, by Grant Rodiak, who's a great designer, but uh, who works in kind of small batch. So when you when, when Grant puts a game on Kickstarter, he's only going to produce a few hundred of them. And he's not really interested in starting a game company. And so when, when we were playing it, one of the things that I was thinking about is like, th this is a good opportunity for us to spotlight a really incredible designer mm. and to give them hopefully a bigger platform. And uh, so I'll just, a lot of things about the project made sense on the back end. Yeah. I have to say it, it is probably the most accessible leader games game yeah, uh, I, coming out. I mean, you don't have a, a pile of asymmetric factions. You don't have a, a deceivingly looking friendly surface with a war game buried underneath. Uh, but that, that card play, the fact that your market and the way that you're stealing or switching or convincing other people's hands to come into your own and the decision between what to play and what to use, like, because you have to prepare for final rounds, really does come through. And I, I'd have to agree, I haven't seen another deck builder do something quite like that. Um, mm -hmm. So it stands out in a really unique way. I'm, I'm really excited to cover it. I can't wait to play it more. Um, so if you guys could just go ahead and like pack up one of the prototypes yeah. or something and, and we're, we're, ship we're it. trying, <laughs> sounds good. Perfect. So the other, the other thing I wanted to go into mostly cause these videos are produced for myself. I'm, I'm fairly selfish when it comes to them. Uh, That's good. I, I would love to know more about you personally. Um, I'd like to, to learn about your history, the progression to the point you're at now. I know a lot of people that take the time to listen to these type of conversations are either your critical fan base, people who are going to listen and follow through and, and be there for everything that you do, or oftentimes a wide mix of other game designers, developers, people who are brand new in this space, trying to figure out what it means and, and what, what sort of venues there are there for them to get to a position in a similar kind of equivalency to where you are, right? And so I think in my theory – hearing other people's stories and understanding the pathways and the struggles and the challenges they've been through to get to a point where they can exist in the board game space and, and design totally. and create things um, and work 12 hours, you know, 12 hours straight in order to, to bring something to fruition. Um, I think it helps everyone that is currently in that process, um, which is why they seek it out. So wherever, wherever you want to start, I'd love to hear what your version of your story is. Well, I'll, I'll start a little backwards. Um, this is this is an interesting industry. I mean, I think I've I have not been in the industry long. I mean, I really think about myself as being in the industry for really only the past three years or so. Uh, but I've I've been designing games longer than that. And uh, one thing that I like about the industry is that it's sort of an industry of misfits. Uh, no one goes to school to become you know a tabletop marketer or a board game designer. Uh, people stumble into it. They they hustle into it. However. And what that means is when it comes to backgrounds, I mean, obviously, um, there are like a lot of white men in it. There are a lot of people in their 40s. You know what I mean? Like it has there are certain there are certain commonalities. But when you get to like the occupational background, there's a huge variety uh, and, and there, there's no one story that people didn't sort of like come up through, you know, Hasbro and now they're in, in the industry. Although there are people who did. Um, I never. um wanted to be a board game designer this wasn't something i was like questing for i didn't want a full-time uh piece of the industry and I, and I don't mean to sound ungrateful because i i love my job and i wouldn't trade it for anything really uh but it was something that i so i sometimes when people ask me like oh how do i get a job in the game industry i think you're thinking about this question very backwards because if you want to make games i can give you advice on how you can make games 
And there might be a way that that turns into a job in the industry, but the job isn't the point. It's like the work that you do. Um, so I, you know, when I, when I try to track my own like strange path uh, to this job, I really was just doing things that I felt that I, that I could do and that were personally interesting. And then it happened to be that it could translate into something that was sustainable for, for, for myself and my family. Um, and, and, and I'll kind of walk through that. So, I mean, I, I've been playing games for a really long time. I, I started playing games when I was quite young. My, my father was really interested in games, uh, but like sports, chess, and then risk, but like games were, and play was a really important component of my childhood and something that like my dad would go out and play hockey with us every day. And he would play chess with us in the evenings. And it was just playing games. It was like our TV. It was like just the thing that we were always doing. Uh, and so it was really important. We had a rule growing up that like we couldn't join league sports, didn't want us joining league sports, but we didn't want know how have to know how to play all of the sports. And if we wanted to play football, we had to go find nine other, other friends and put together a little pickup football game. And so uh, that a lot of my, my childhood was like running around trying to recruit people to play roller hockey and strapping them to a pair of skates and teaching them how to skate or something. Uh, and so games were just part of that. There was no like jock nerd divide. There was no like game shame here. And, and, and I, I don't mean to discredit those things happen to people, but for us, it was like play is just important. And then when I was in fifth grade or sixth grade, uh, an uncle, my, my dad's older brother, dropped me off a box of old Avalon Hill War games, like Third Reich, uh, Chancellorsville, Tactics 2, that kind of stuff. And uh, I uh, did not really understand how these games worked, but I liked maps <laughs> and I liked kind of like playing with them. Um, and then, so I, we were always like playing these old Avalon Hill games, totally butchering the rules, barely making sense of them. And then, uh, battle cry came out when I was in sixth grade or seventh grade, I think. And we played a ton of battle cry. And then I had, um, we had access to early copies of Catan, like not, you know, the, the weird orange German one was the first Catan I played. Uh, and then I, I had a friend in, in middle school and high school who's, uh, he had a relative who was really interested in board games. And so wh whichever game was like winning the spiel or what was doing really well in Germany, like, so he would send him the new Leah games. And I remember get him getting a copy of Taj Mahal right when it came out uh, and Puerto Rico. And so these were just like the games that we, we were playing. It was complete random luck. Um, so, you know, I was, I was really interested in, in board games and kind of where modern design was like 2003, 2004. And then when I went to college, I stopped playing video games and I kept playing board games. And I remember I had a copy of El Grande in my dorm and we played it so much. Like we, we, we play, it's like an embarrassing amount. We were playing El Grande like four times a week for like three months. We had, we had meta strategy strategies. We'd get into arguments about the game. Um, and we, so it just kind of kept deepening. And, you know, over the course of that whole process, I found that uh, I loved talking about games and thinking about games. And I would make variants. Um, in college, I started playing Twilight Imperium with, um, which is a game I had played for a long time, but I started playing it with people who play tested for Fantasy Flight. And so they, they were talking about variants and thinking about, and started let, making me think about the, the game design. I remember there were a couple days where, we would go over meaning to play Twilight Imperium, but instead we just talk about Twilight Imperium for two hours. And they're like, well, it's too late. Let's play a quick game of Kalos and then we'll talk about Twilight Imperium some more. And so I, I was in and I was I was really participating a lot on Board Game Geek. And I just found that I loved the conversation around games almost more than playing them. Right. Uh, which is a, a crazy way of thinking about it. Um, and then in graduate school, I went to the University of Texas for graduate school. And I happened to be near a game store called Great All Hall Games, which is not there anymore. But they had a bunch of Phil Eklund's games on the shelves. It was like the Great Hall Games. I, I want there to be more game stores like this. And I'm afraid they're, they're just this is a, a dying breed, which is they stock nothing you've ever heard of. It's like just a like, you know, maybe it once used to be like a puzzle store and they, they have like a bunch of weird like Colvini games from the late 90s. Just a very weird offbeat hobby store you know if you go to a, a model plane store it's like oh what is this strange german game i've never even heard of it um it was like that and i started playing uh phil eklund's games and one of the things i, I really liked about them is i had never seen a game argue or real and so phil's games always have um they always have arguments and oftentimes i i disagree with them 
but they are arguing. It's like a different way of a game. A game can speak. He's got wild footnotes, and like his games are always about like really weird. Um, they're, they're not. They're not weird. That they just have interesting subjects. And so I'd never seen a game talk like that. And uh, in the back of the rule book for this game called Pax Perfuriana, he had this little notice that said, "Hey, uh, if you think you have a Pax game, you should send it to me." And then we'll figure it out. And he like put his phone number maybe in like a an AOL email account. I mean, it's very bespoke. Uh, and so I just like I saw that note and it got in my head. And so I thought, oh, well, I love Phil's game, Lords of the Renaissance. I want to make a PAX version of PAX Renaissance. And so I sent Phil, I spent like all of my Thanksgiving break in graduate school working on this PAX Renaissance game. Sent it to Phil. He kind of patted me on the head and was like, oh, yeah, pretty good. It was very bad. Uh, I barely knew what I was doing. Um, but I just like that conversation got me into Phil's sort of circle. And then and he has like a maybe 10 people or so that are always helping him design or did at that point. And then sort of two things happened at once. This is a very long answer, but I'm going to give it in full. Uh, two things happened at once. One is I wanted to teach myself how to do graphic design. So I started doing redraws for fun. And Phil liked some of my redraws I did of his earlier games. I did a redraw of the map of Lords of, the, of Sierra Madre and then a full redraw of um, Lords of the Renaissance. Phil liked those. And then when he was playtesting Greenland, he asked for help. And I was really involved in Greenland. I helped. A, I worked a lot on that game. Um, and then it was during that process, sort of two things happened at the same moment. One was I... Um, Phil asked me if I wanted to tr take another stab at a PAX game. And I was telling him about the notes of what would become PAX Premier, and he was really interested in it. And the second thing is I had a, I had a close friend of mine uh, die. And, it, you know, uh, when someone who is your age dies, it has a way of, like, shaking you a little bit. And it, it, it really, it was like my son was born, Phil asked me about this game design, and then I had a, a close friend die all in about the space of a month. And it was enough to be like, okay, actually, what do I want to be doing? I want to make things. I want to participate in this conversation. And so I just started working on Pamir. And we tested it. And we worked on it for about a year. And then, you know, I, my, my, my confidence kind of flagged and I wasn't sure it was going to make it. And then my brother happened to be living with us for six months. And while he was living with us, we worked on it and we submitted it. And then Phil said yes. And then over the course of graduate school, we got in this rhythm where I would kind of try to give Phil a new game every year. And he knew that um, I had a good enough development team and a good enough editorial team and I could do the graphics myself that he didn't have to worry about me. He would just kind of like, all right, you know that you have to give me the files by May 1st. So like I would show him a prototype and then he would be like, yeah, go ahead, do that thing. And then I would give him the files on May 1st and then it would come out at Essen. And I just did it because it seemed like um, there was just something about it that uh, felt very uh, natural. I mean, I don't know, that's a way, weird way of putting it or a better way of putting it might be when I was um, working on John Company, I delayed my dissertation defense because I had to finish John Company. And I remember telling my 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 uh, advisor this, and he thought I was a little crazy for this. But I, but I said, look, I, I may never finish this game. And if I don't make this game about the East India Company, I don't think anybody's going to make it. So this is actually weirdly more important than my dissertation. And uh, the game's never paid that well at this point, but it was always it was enough to keep going. And because I was doing so, I was owning so many of the, my own processes, I kept being able to demand higher and higher royalties, um, which like, again, this isn't a lot of money, but my graduate stipend at the time was like probably 20 grand a year, which is not a lot to have a family of four on, uh, but we were making it work. Uh, and so the, the game design income was actually like keeping us a little bit above water and it was a very reasonable thing for doing. Um, and so I, I, I know I thought this would just kind of continue forever, that I would just kind of every year, I'm gonna give Phil a game. Um, and then right when I finished graduate school, um, I thought I was going to go find a job at the university and I had a, my, a job fall through. And around that time, um, Patrick Leader uh, posted that he needed a game developer. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to send him. I'm just going to send him what I've done. Nice cover letter. I didn't even format my CV. I gave him like the exact same CV that I would give to an academic job. So it was like, you know, they had the conferences I had spoken at on it. And I was like, look, you know, here... I really like thinking about games and working on them. 
I don't know if I'm a right fit for you. Uh, and that started this like month long wooing process where Patrick would uh, try to convince me to come. And I was like, well, I don't know. And then I'd be like, okay, yeah, you know what? This is going to be great. And Patrick's like, well, this might be a little irresponsible. The company's going to run out of money or we're not sure if we're going to make it. Uh, and we, we just kind of had this, this little back and forth. Uh, but eventually, you know, I, I remember having th this moment after I d d defended where I just needed to make a decision about what I was going to do next. And I remember telling Patrick, like, I love throwing myself at projects. And so, like, if you really want me to, like, throw myself this product, you've got to give me a job. And if not, I'm going to go, like, work at a bank or something. Uh, and he was like, you know what? Let's just do it. And so I moved up to Minnesota, and we worked on Root, and I worked like a maniac on Root. It was like a many 10-hour days for, like, a full year. Um, and then Root took off, and we've just kind of kept doing it. But the whole thing has been very improvisational. And, you know, at, at every stage in the project, it wasn't like – the end goal is to get a job at a design house. What I wanted to do was just make the kind of games that I liked. I mean, this is, a, you made a joke earlier. You said that it's a little, self, the way you conduct these interviews is kind of fundamentally selfish because you ask the questions that are interesting to yourself. That's my design practice. Like I don't, and I think this is a big reason why, um, and I, I there, there is no shame in this, but most of the designers I know who work in the industry well, you want to make something that sells. And there, there, there are good reasons to make something that, that sells. But I think for me, I've been very lucky to be protected from those questions because when I look at the marketplace of games, I still see holes where like I want to play a certain type of game. And I feel lucky that I'm able to try to make those games to fill those holes. But ultimately, I'm making games for like myself and my brother and our little group. <laughs> Uh, and if they resonate with other people, that's great. But it's, it's, a, it's a bonus. It's an interesting note. Uh, and one that I heard uh, Sami uh, Las Lasco, Lasco uh, the designer of Dale of Merchants. I don't know if you're familiar with that that deck building mm -hmm. game. Um, he, he reiterated that same element. His initial desire wasn't to make anything that succeeded. His initial desire was to create a game that he wanted to play that he couldn't find to play and he wanted his kind of family his sister his his the people around him to be able to sit down and play a game that they could experience in the way that that they wanted as well and i i think while financially that is a hard way to approach it if you're at a point where you need to where you need your game to succeed and make you money and make a living like sometimes those bills overwhelm that sense that game design and the process around it or media creation and the process around it, any of these kind of artistic forms, if you're doing something that you get fulfilled by, that you're rewarded by, that you're excited to produce, then the final product oftentimes will have an audience that is not only uh, similar to you in a lot of ways, people that want, that have been desiring to play that game, but didn't go about the process of making it. Or in my case, people who wanted to see this type of media, like my initial yeah. concept was, I couldn't find I couldn't find board game gameplay videos that I personally enjoyed watching as much as video game gameplay videos. So mm -hmm. the past year and a half of bit has been a experiment and test to like, how can I produce the thing that I wanted to see? Um, and not that it wasn't out there. I just mm -hmm. couldn't find I couldn't find it or I couldn't find enough of it. Um, so it's well, and, and yeah, there's it's an there interesting are, point. Are, there are a number of things here, too. Like I, I actually I love the process of making things. I mm -hmm. love it. Um, and the, the, this also gets back to like what, to my childhood, my brother and I were always making things. My dad, um, was always kind of jumping from one small business to another. Um, it's just to me, like creation, uh, any kind of creation is like, it's an essential part of like who I am. Like, I just, I want to build things. Um, and I actually like doing that more than consuming them. I would rather like go out with, with a camcorder and like make a stupid short movie than like watch a short movie. Um, this is just kind of like how I've always approached these sorts of things. Uh, and, and so when, when, you know, when I'm working with, with my brother on Whirly gig or with, 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 with Patrick at leader game stuff, I actually still do like a lot of the graphic design, um, towards like right to the end of the project. And then, then we'll hand it off to one of our professionals on the staff, but I love doing the graphic design just because it, to me, it's just like part of the process. It's like, I want to, I want to, you know, burn my own plates or whatever. Um, and the other thing uh, in terms of 
thinking about which projects to take, a really important part of Leader Games right now for me is when we think about accepting new projects, the question I will always ask the project leader or Patrick, if he's looking at a new project, is, is this something you really want to exist? Um, because to me, the fact that a game might sell well is like not enough. And in fact, if that is our primary reason for doing something, uh, we are losing it. Uh, and so it's always like, look, do you want, like, do you want this thing to exist right now? I mean, the way I tend to think about it is we have access to tremendous creative infrastructure at leader games. We've got staff, really good development staff, a great art and design team, a really good usability team. We can tackle these kinds of projects. Uh, so we should use this bandwidth. And uh, when I was working on Oath, Patrick was like, well, do you want to wait like a couple more years and then like do it so you can have a little more time to design it? And I was like, no, like I don't, I mean, I, I, I'm not a fatalist, but I don't know if we're still going to have this infrastructure or the, the, the character of the company might have changed. Um, you know, the, the world could end. I want to use this moment to make something at, that um, the way, the way I, I often think about Oath especially is um, I was initially quite worried about the design because it is so resource intensive. I don't, I don't think people fully grasp this, that like it, the, the development resources that we have to direct at Oath are probably tenfold a normal board game in that price category and probably like three times as much as Root. Why is and, that? Uh, it's, just, it's just because of, of the scope of the design. The, the design has uh, so many systems that are so interactive that can exist in all these different ways because of the chronicle nature of the game. Uh, it's just very resilient. And then on the production side, it's an expensive game to make. It's got a absolute mountain of art. I mean, we're really looking at like a Keyforge level production budget. Uh, and so when I, when I was first getting ready sorry, to Kyle. Do, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> but part of it, I was like, Kyle, I want to play the studio's strengths. You're our strength. So, like, do you want to go to this fantasy world and just live here for a straight year? And he consented. <laughs> if you would have said no, I would have done something different. Um, it, we A lot of the work that we do at Leader is consensus-based. It's really sure. important to me that, like, it's not we, – I, I, it's really important to me that we don't vote on things. And it's really important that we, like, rarely take unilateral, unilateral action. You want to build consensus around everything. Uh, but when I was getting ready to, to pitch Oath, I was worried because I was like, oh, this project is so risky. And then I started like turning that logic on his head where I was like, we're the only company that would ever do a game like this. This is like too, it's just too expensive. It's sort of like uh, Fantasy Fly is the only company that would ever do TI. And the only reason it happened is because it's like Christian Peterson's thing. And it was like his going, uh, as I understand it, I don't know if this is true, but the way I have pieced together the story of TI4 is it's like Christian Peterson's going away present, right? Um, that, that was always my sense of it. I, I could be totally wrong. I don't know these people, but it, it's like, it, it's just, it didn't make any sense. It's like a giant game with an IP that doesn't tie into a major license. Uh, it has hard plastic miniatures. It has 20 factions. It would have made more sense for them to put them in expansions and kind of milk the product. And said so they just did it all at once. Um, and you, you can, one of the things I like about it is you see someone thinking like, no, this is something that we're uniquely position to do so we're going to do it uh and and when i'm when i'm speaking as like the the head of development and we're looking at new games for leader uh whenever people are giving me pitches the moment someone says this is a t hot tip for anybody who's going to pitch me uh the moment someone says like oh i showed this to like z-man they're really interested i always say like great go to z-man i don't even want to talk to you anymore you just made my day you opened up my schedule thank you um because uh, the only games that I want Leader to publish are the games that Leader only Leader would publish. You know, like this is why we liked SBQF so much. It's like a weird little odd duckling. Like Fort is a beautiful, fun game. It's super accessible and very wonderful, but it's also like kind of an odd duck. And so, like this was a good, or, you know, Leader was a good home for it. Um, and that, that's kind of the mentality I take I, when I'm looking at what games I think we should we we should do. I do appreciate your phraseology there, use of a, an odd duck. I, that of is very on brand. So play I'll, to uh, the audience that. Natur naturally. Uh, so I do want to make sure I'm respecting your time and the audience who I had submit questions time. And while there are a pile of things I'd like to dig into when it comes to this personal things, right? I will stop being selfish for a moment and let's go ahead and start going through uh, some of these, some of these core fan questions and see, see where they lead. Cool. Uh, I'll also, so I'll answer a little more uh, tersely. 
<laughs> no, you're good. I, I wanted to hear everything you just said. So don't don't feel the need to answer tersely. I just want to make sure that uh, that I, I can bring you back onto the channel at a future date and not sure. have you this going. I'm never going on Quackalope again. <laughs> All right. Well, fire away. So these will these will mix up a little bit um, between primarily root and oath. Some of them are comparison. Some of them are combined. Um, so I'll I'll do my best to try to format them. But there probably will be a little bit of jumping here. Um, I hope that's that's OK. That's fine. Jump away. Uh, up here with Cadis. With root and oath in mind, have you thought about something that shines at low player counts, maybe even just a two player game specifically? Uh, he loves the style of those two games but sometimes it's hard to get those games down at, at two players. Is there something in the pipeline? So I, th maybe, I'm not sure. T two player design is really hard. Uh, and it's, it's a different, like if you have to put games in different classes, the difference between a solo game and a two player game is like that, that, that degree of difference is also, uh, can also be found between a two player game and a three plus player game. And there are differences between a three-player game and a four-player game and a five-player game. But all of those differences are very small compared to the leap between three and two. So one thing I'm, I'm wanting to do with the new root factions I'm working on is create factions that are really good at two players. Um, like like the Duchy, which I think is a pretty good two-player faction. Um, Oath's two-player mode is getting a lot of work right now, and I think it's pretty good. Um, I want to I want to push it a little bit harder. Uh, I'm working on a game right there. I am working on something that's very early on that will be probably like two to four players, um, and the two-player will be a principal element. I'm not really working on anything that's just two players because most of my own interests are towards like multilateral conflict. I also think the two player space is just really well covered right now. Um, last year, uh, Kramer's game, uh, Watergate is like completely brilliant. And I honestly think like between Watergate and 13 days, that those are the kinds of two player games that I would want to design. And the fact that they already exist means I get to spend my attention on something else. Sure, that's fair. Uh, Andy is asking if root cards, management system is an exercise in all right here's a prime prime example about why i'm having other people help me source these questions because i don't even know what this word is falcatanian oh, biopolitics codian ah so you know what it is perfect mm -hmm. that's all i need i need the person asking the question and the person answering it to understand, to understand that word. Just the and each faction interacts in this exercise in its own way what are the thoughts on this and what and what the moles and crows represent or how they interact uh so what? How do the moles, moles and right? So I, I, I understand system? the question. So the um, so this uh, there's a funny conceit in root, and I, I'm happy that like it's visible in the design because sometimes I make weird philosophical arguments that like don't translate, and nobody even realizes <laughs> the argument I'm trying to make. But for some reason, this one's stuck stuck on. The basic idea is that um, the cards in in root aren't just objects or events. I actually wanted to think about like what the, a card meant in the game. Um, so, for instance, I really dislike event decks. I really it's like action decks and things like that because w what those decks are doing is um, covering for the uh, limitations of a system. So, like in in TI because I have TI on my mind lately. Uh, there's an action card called Direct Hit, uh, which means you know if you hit a, a a ship that can sustain damage, it instantly explodes, which is a great bit of flavor. Um, they put it there so that they didn't have to create a dice hit system that was complicated enough to have critical hits. They could let the action card do that work. But, you know, what does an action card represent in TI? It's like, I don't know, like luck maybe or something like that. Um, spies, sort of. I mean, it, it, it's hard to figure out what, ex what exactly they're doing. So with Root... Uh, I was like, okay, I want the deck to be built around. I want the deck to be a really important part of the game's argumentation. And the idea with Root is that um, this is a this is an inhabited world, and in fact, the inhabitants are the primary currency, the primary you know force of of the game. And so, managing those inhabitants allows you to like manage the space in the game. And so the factions then do different things with the inhabitants uh, that kind of mirror their uh, geopolitical positions. So like the Erie is the best example. Um, there are um, 
a, a stable, like they're all about stability and imposing order. So they will arrange these inhabitants in a certain order on their decree. And that order gradually develops, but it's also somewhat locked and not very fluid. The cats, on the other hand, have and spend, right? So like you, you like see people cycle through and then you, you spend them. And it's all about, you know, am I going to convert this card to extra work for the wood? Am I going to convert this card to an extra action by like hiring the bird mercenaries? Uh, with the new factions, uh, the new factions are a little, uh, they're, they're a slightly different because they are Patrick's factions. But when Patrick was working on them, I tried to find ways that we could like hook this into the way the game thought about things. So for example, the duchy, um, you are holding cards of certain suits and you're usually actually keeping the same hand from turn to turn, which is a little bit like what the Erie does. But the, the duchy also will need to cannibalize their own their own hand position for certain for certain things, right? So with the Erie, um, you're making a promise and you, you are trying to remain stable for as long as possible. And you have almost every interest in remaining stable. For the duchy, you, you use the stability and cannibalize it when you, when you need to, which is sort of how I feel like that kind of aggressive expansionist empire is going to treat its biopolitical framework. That's the graduate school hook into there. Um, crows are a little more complicated. They don't play with the cards as much to, to me. Uh, the crows are completely transactional, right? Like every card is a link to a board position, but usually they want to exit that. Uh, like they, they have no interest in holding onto those connections. That kind of answers the question, <laughs> or maybe it gives yeah, for enough sure. answers. I, I understood a degree of that, which is fine. I'm well, Foucauldian is a very was really fun interesting. Word to say. <laughs> Foucauldian is not a word that, when read, is is easy to say. It's uh, all right. I, I called him Foucault. Fo like I had read one of I had read one of Michel Foucault's books before I stopped calling him Foucault. So there's no shame in it. Fair enough. Uh, here with Passer. Uh, Directly on route, which fan-made faction is your favorite, and what are some of the innovative ideas for the game mechanics that you maybe haven't thought of? So I my my current favorite, and I don't like, I don't want to. I'm not gonna slam anybody. I'm gonna say that I'm gonna say it this way. Uh, many of the fan factions need a ton of work, but they're still really fun and good. So like, there, there's this thing happening where like in certain faction combinations, a fan faction is excellent but it has like low resilience. And one of the biggest jobs of developing a root fa uh, faction is making sure it works in a lot of different scenarios. So my rule for root development in general is uh, the whole game should be better for your inclusion. It should change the character of the game that this faction is playing for everyone. I don't want, I've seen some other people try to do asymmetrical uh, asymmetric d design. And the thing that always bums me out is when they're like, they just create mini games <laughs> that that you have to do as a player. And I'm like, no, it's about the interaction. Uh, that to me is the really essential element of good asymmetric design. So my one of my, my current favorites is um, the oh my gosh, I'm, for, I'm forgetting the name. I think it's called like the Daily Croak. Uh, they're they're frog journalists and. They have to be in clearings where action is happening. So, like, they want to stir it up sometimes. You know, That's want, fantastic. Want to make some news. I already want to and play I, them. Like, I, I was a journalism student uh, when uh, as an undergrad, and I like I love His Girl Friday. It's like one of my favorite movies, and it's just they, they capture that like chaotic mid twentieth century journalism like feel very well, and like the, um, the 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 chaotic and instigating press, which I love as an idea. I love it. Uh, and so the, 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 their current fave, the, there are a ton of them. I mean, I, I think I am, Patrick is a lot more ahead on the fan faction stuff um, because he, he really keeps up with it and plays them. I know he recently played like the tavern, uh, which he really liked. Uh, and I was, I was intrigued by the report he gave back. I, I would actually, I'm excited after I finish oath to work on some more root content. And one of the first things I want to do is like survey what, where the fan factions are and just see what people are even thinking about. No, I, I know it. Um, as far as kind of conversations over the last few months, Root is still like it's not a finished product, right? Like the the there is likely going to be more factions. What is the current state of that? Are they um, are they in development at all? Do you have ideas around what's coming? 
So I've got a few. I basically have like four factions right now that I've been kind of cooking on for a while. Um, and there are a couple of different ways to do it. I have uh, an idea for how to do a uh, campaign system for Root, which would be kind of a fun capstone that would allow you to chain scenarios together. Um, and in order to do that, that would necessitate coming up with, with a couple extra factions to make it to make it work properly. Um, and one of the things I, I've loved about working on Oath is it's really made me realize some of the promise of truly organic campaign design. And so I kind of want to see if I can apply some of those lessons to Root. Uh, I've got a lot of uh, a lot of those factions are, are, are cooking uh, right now. Um, there's there's a faction that's sort of like um, a theocracy. Um, it's a little bit like an established li lizard cult or an established with an alliance. And then I have another one that is a um, a society that's in civil war, like the, that's in internal chaos that you can play off that I'm really intrigued by. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are a few others as well. Um, where what, what I would like to do, so we want to do at least one more wave, maybe two more waves of, of root stuff. And then the cost of development on root is just increasing exponentially and we all know a lot about exponential numbers now but basically um because we want everything to work with everything else and for it to be truly modular it just takes a lot of testing at each step and so what i've told patrick is um we may we might get like four or maybe six more root factions and then we're, we're done that like it's going to be cheaper for us to like go to the moon <laughs> than to develop more more root content um one part of the core system that I want to revisit that I'm revisiting right now is um, a revised setup rules that will basically integrate the picking of factions, maps, decks, all that stuff with the setup and setup priority because the current setup system in root is the only part of the design that isn't modular and it worked fine when there were only six factions, but now that we've got eight and if we're going to go to 10 or 12 or 16, we really need to revise those setup rules. So I'm, I'm just excited by like, I think like fi figuring out that and then hopefully it will allow us to like make an official tournament scenario. And so people can actually like play root quote competitively. I don't really know what that means yet, but it's something that we're, we're, we're thinking about. So when you were when you were developing Root, those those four core factions, did you think that that down the road quickly you'd be saying six or eight or twelve? No, no, it really was like four, four felt like I remember telling, um, telling my, my partner, Katie, uh, when, when I was working on Root, I was like, I feel like I've spent four games of thought on this game. Like each so one of these could have been, a, yeah, could have been a game. Um, and so I felt pretty tapped out. And then when Patrick was like, we're going to do two more, we should do two more. I'm like, okay, here are notes for two more. Uh, and, and we kind of spitballed with each other and, and figured out. Uh, what, what they could do, and then I said about designing them. And after we had the six, I was like, okay, the six are good. And, and you know, this is like my general attitude about games is like, if imagine I only got six root factions, I'm glad those six are out there. Uh, but then when Patrick offered his offered his two, I was like, oh, these are these are good. Um, and I, I mean, I really like the the crows and the moles, and I also like what they do to the rest of the game. So now, I mean, I, I kind of, I'm not ready. I personally, I'm not ready to leave root yet. I've got like, I've got some more stuff I want to put in that game. Um, but also if we had to stop, I feel really happy with. Well, it's and it's interesting because I, I have listened to some of your other conversations. And one thing that I heard you echo um, in other conversations is adding an expansion to a existing title does risk that core title, right? It does. You don't want the expansion to take away from it or break it or, ruin sort of the standing that that initial product has and the interesting thing is you know with with the underground you know the underground duchy and the corbett conspiracy coming into root root has root was already one of my favorite games and those two factions have have lifted it up to a pedestal that like i just absolutely love where it is right now and i can't wait i don't think it feels finished as a fan as someone that loves playing your products i'm excited for what's coming next and i trust you all when it comes to the development phase but i but i also agree that where it is i mean it feels so good and and the, the partisan deck and the integration of how the duchy and how the corvid mix up kind of the entire expanse i love what you all have done oh thank you so uh let's continue going through these questions because i feel like i'm i'm sprinting uh sprinting out of time here so from you I, I I'm so sorry that I'm going to butcher your name. Assume that I'm butchering everyone's name. 
Uh, so context. The political strength of the Vagabond forces players to stop him preemptively with a harsh measure. Uncalled for aggression on turn two uh, to activate hostile status, embargo on crafting. Some players go as far as keeping the coffee card in their hand the whole game to prevent the tinkerer from crafting it. Question. Was such a hostile climate intended, and was the Vagabond meant to be a fugitive being hit at every corner? Yes. Uh, this was the biggest. I was a little surprised when people... I, I wasn't surprised by it totally, but um, the, the dominance of the Vagabond was something that we didn't really have in studio because we always played him as a, a Vagabond that, like, he w you didn't want him around. You did not want the Vagabond around. He was too strong to be around. So usually um, what would happen is the Vagabond would be most successful when he was playing on the borders of Erie and Cat territory because he could, uh, so, so the cats never really wanted to hit him because he was tearing into the birds or the birds didn't want to hit him because he was tearing into the cats. So he would like pick a side early on, but by the mid game, he was hostile to both of those other factions. And then he would go sulking to the, the wooden Alliance. That was how it often uh, turned, although there were different variants on that, depending on how the early game went. Um, but yeah, th 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 that's precisely right. I mean, we wanted him to be more of a fugitive character. Um, there were there are a lot of interesting things about the, the development of, of, the, of the Vagabond um, that I, I won't really, I won't get into now, but I might talk about on some future date. Um, but the main thing is, yes, we, we wanted him to be a bit more hated. And it's a funny thing because people will be like, oh, that Vagabond, he's too powerful. He keeps winning my games. And I'm like, okay, so the next time you start a game, learn a lesson, and don't treat him like a friend. Well, and I think it goes into the way that some of us approach and teach the Vagabond as well. We teach him as sort of the out-of-the-mix character, the character that is sort of on a RPG story, a hero that can just kind of venture through the woods, par partially due to the flavor text there. Um, but he does need to be beat up on it a little bit. Uh, if you if someone knows how to play him, he certainly can, can take it away. Uh, up here with uh, Jutlander. Uh, considering that there are now four factions that set up in the corner, coin faction, so to speak, basically a high reach faction in the future, if there was a five player game with only coin factions, including a hypothetical fifth coin faction, where do you think it would be placed? Um, hmm. Well, this is like a big question. The, the question of where the fifth faction is in, um, Okay, so let me, I'm going to back out and answer this question differently. So, um, part of the problem is thinking about the scope of what Root can do as a game. So, if, you, if it's primarily the story about a single state, then you're like, okay, so there is internal threat A, internal threat B, internal threat C or something, right? Uh, and then maybe you can have one external threat. As soon as you have, like, two external threats... Um, the games have this problem where they start becoming decentered, and so they become less about insurgency and more about geopolitics. If that if that makes sense, so I, I wanted I wanted to say that at the start because this is like one of the weird, this is just a weird characteristic of these games. Um, so one of the things I I think that the, the cats to me represent so the, the cats to me re represent. Uh, a particular style of governing and that their victory points are tied to a certain way that, that uh, a, f a, f a, um, a system can generate legitimacy. What I would want to, so I, I, my own tendency is to think about another faction that would exist on the, farther like a farther level of abstraction above everything else so this is for instance like if you were to play a game where okay so imagine just the four basic root factions and then the fifth faction is the broader empire uh that the cats are only a single province of and so they have an imperial master that is going to if they're upset with the cats jump in and maybe push them out that would be one way of of sort of imagining that fifth uh, state um, and actually I, I think this is kind of the, the, the trick that Pamir does where uh, I think the fifth so uh, we always this is a very scattered answer but um, I'm, I'll, I'll do what I can um, when we're thinking about uh, 
positions in governments, we always have a purity of intent, right? Because you, um, if you're playing uh, Germany or France or something in diplomacy, all of the complexity of the state is you. You, you're a single person acting on behalf of a state. Uh, states don't work like that. They, I mean, even um, even one person and their own diplomatic corps are going to have different opinions about what to do. So one, if I was thinking about <coughs> fifth positions in a coin game, I want the out of power party in uh, in, in the government. Right, which is kind of like watching for the government's failure and then trying to take take the role of the government. Actually, I'm working on a um, I'm working on a uh, a game about reconstruction right now, and uh, one player is playing. Uh, it's a little bit modeled off of a coin game, and uh, one player plays, you know, the government, the army, um, and then another player is playing the out of power um, Democrats. Right. And so they, they, they're kind of wanting the government to fail so they can capitalize it and retake the White House or um, they, they want to, you know, form a coalition with the more moderate uh, re re Republicans who might be getting a little war weary. So I think that kind of like inter like anything that um, complicates the purity of, of a player position like, and especially the government player position is a natural like fifth seat for a coin game, if that makes sense. Interesting. So I do I do want to make sure I'm being very purposeful because I will talk to you for <laughs> as long as possible. What is your sense of time? And should we start sprinting through the fan fan questions? Uh, well, let's pick up the, the pace just a tiny bit, but I, I've got another half an hour. I got I got some time. OK, I just wanted to make sure I was I was checking in because I have yeah, I, I uh, if anyone watches my videos, I have a habit of talking for longer than anyone really wants me to. So that's uh, pretty, pretty consistent. Uh, Joe Kari. How do you approach converting political themes and ideas such as courtly intrigue, switching loyalties, shifting power into game mechanics? Uh, so I usually think about – so to me, there's a few different uh, levels of abstraction. So the first thing I'll think about is um, what is the tension that I want players to um, – to have on their mind. And sometimes I think about those tensions in two ways. There's the tension between myself and the system, and there's the tension between myself and another player. And then there's the tension between the system and that other player, right? So you like, kind of do this weird triangulation. From there, I try to think about a framework that is gonna create those tensions, but I'm really thinking about a system of interaction. And then the mechanism, by the time I get to figuring out what the mechanism is, it's usually like obvious, like it's a little bit like doing art by subtraction where like there's only one mechanism that's even going to work because I'm like, OK, I need a system where when you um, send your spies over to me, it hurts my capabilities and then also gives you a little bit more position on this victory access. OK, well, like the way to do that is to make it so your pieces can move on to my uh, action like wh where my action potential is and have a kind of like silencing or muting effect on those actions. And so things like the spy ring and Pamir were just like organic outgrowths of like, okay, I need a mechanism that will deliver these like three tensions. Now, this is a very backwards way of design. I don't recommend it to people <laughs> generally because it, it creates frustrations um, because it means that like when I'm play testing, my games change a lot. Because I don't have a loyalty to a mechanism. A lot of times when people are working in game design, they come up with a single mechanism and then build the game around the mechanism. And I work in the opposite way. I think about what's the tension I want to create and then is this the mecha right mechanism for it? And if we play it and it doesn't quite fire right, throw it away, find a new mechanism. Uh, but that's generally the way I go about doing it. But it's always about when, when, I, when I'm trying to think about a mechanism, the primary, I, I mean, I literally just like make lists of like, okay, what does this thing need to do? And then I think about other games who cover similar subjects and look at what they did and what might be the problems with them. And I just kind of very slowly worm my way to the right answer. There's no like special secret to it. It's just so uh, it, it's slow. <laughs> sort of uh, sort of in that same mechanic, a question coming from from Quirk. How do you decide on the proper action economy and what made you decide X, X faction gets Y action? Uh, so the, well, okay. There are two questions, um, about, I'm going to divide those questions. So sure. 
Action economy is, I think, one of the hardest things about game design because what you're trying to do is establish a narrative rhythm and you don't want people to be like, you know, so you, it's, it's very, it's very musical. Like you're having to deal with like pace and, you know, how long, so you have to deal with like, how fast do we want the conversation? If, if we do one action, one action, one action, one action, um, it's going to cut down on downtime. But it's going to do this funny thing when it comes to narrative where it's not going to allow us to like chunk uh, our actions into meaningful like narrative segments. So with Oath, for instance, we actually ran a test of Oath where instead of having uh, nor right now the game has focus, which are like these action points. You spend a bunch of focus on your turn, then it's the next person's turn. We did an experiment with Oath where we took that away and we said, hey, on your turn, just take an action. No harm, just take an action, and well, because I wanted to cut down on downtime. And what happened was um, the game was mechanically interesting like that, but it had this really, really critical problem, which is that you um, you couldn't chain your actions together. So, like at the end of the game, I had no sense of what I had actually done because I wasn't able. And the way the language I started using to talk about this was composing. So like when you compose a sentence or compose a paragraph, it was a little bit like telling a story where you only you take turns just saying one word hmm. as opposed to like contributing a sentence or contributing a small paragraph. Right now, if you contribute too long of a paragraph, uh, the story will also not make any sense, right? You know, and you, you'll have other, all sorts of other problems. So uh, when it comes to action economy, those are the sorts of concerns that I'm thinking about. In terms of pairing which kinds of actions with factions, uh, it's sort of the same answer as I gave the previous question, which is that, um, you know, when I'm working on the cats or when I was helping develop the, the crows, um, I thought about the relationship that the action needed to generate between this faction and the other factions around it. And if it was, if an action wasn't delivering that tension, then it got thrown away. Right. Um, what, one thing that, uh, when we, when I was working on, um, I guess I'm trying to think about a good example of this would be like, uh, when we were developing, uh, mysterious manner, it was really important that, so we unified a bunch of systems in mysterious manner so that like combat kind of works the same, no matter who you're at. <laughs> Who you're with but at the same time we had these thematic like big spider is like big and scary and kind of hulking so it needs to move and attack in a way that kind of shows that um the paladin is like flexible and so we needed an action system that was flexible right the manner was um slow and careful and so we needed an action system that kind of you know that the, the reflected that those um sort of like thematic uh, touchstones or like, I don't know, they're almost like gameplay motifs or something. Um, but so, so all this is to say when I'm thinking about that, those kinds of pairings, I'm trying to be true to whatever the, the thematic intent of the game is. And that's, it ends up just becoming kind of like a question of taste uh, which is like any other kind of artistic production. Well, and, and I find it interesting because over the last year and a half adventure of being a reviewer and playing as many games as I can, I, I've come to be very aware of the fact that I learn and not only exist in the world, but also learn and experience games through a significantly thematic and visual driven process. So as I learn rules, I, st I set them into a storyline that fits my thematic narrative so that I can remember and continue playing the game based around those rules. Uh, and so I, I find it interesting that from a game design process, you're also looking at things in a similar way. It, it's it's a it's a relationship that meshes well with the way that I actually learn, consume, and experience games. And I think whether or not people acknowledge it or, or realize it as much, there's a lot of people that have that same sort of journey in some ways. Well, uh, and, I, and I'll just say very quickly, uh, we're working on an oath right now, and one of the biggest questions I have after a playtest is, um, what was the narrative of the game that we just played? Do we feel like there were parts where that storytelling machinery wasn't meshing? Uh, you know, was there an issue that like if you would have had an extra action or been able to do a certain thing, it would have completed this narrative arc in a way that was meaningful? Uh, and now all the balance questions are still very important, too. But we're like really thinking about the game as a story generator and wanting to make sure it's as robust and expressive as possible. Well, and in the in the version that we played... I was able to, by the end of the game, very 
you know, very accessibly identify the narrative that we just journeyed through. But that wasn't always true for other people that experienced games in different ways. Even some of the people that were playing at the table, a lot of them after the video was over and some of the comments in the comment section was, oh, yeah, I see that story now. Like now that you verbalize it, now that you've told us about <laughs> where where sort of the rebels came from or how the chancellor fell, we can understand and, and grab onto that. But figuring out how to design a game is a that that gives everyone that or gives as many people as possible that narrative journey that is easier maybe for me to come by is something that uh, that you guys are are working on and that that I don't even want to start thinking about. I'll I'll play the game and tell the story. I'll I'll have you guys develop it. Another question here from Kirk uh, or Quirk. Uh, how do you decide or? How did you come up with a proper balance between two asymmetric factions? Uh, or is most of the balance when it comes to a game like Root or Vast designed around players also policing themselves? So Peter Alaka, the designer of Dune, has a great – and Cosmic Encounter has a great comment about how like balance – is like you, you, balance can always take care of itself or something, right? I mean, yeah, he is like, you know, ne never, don't worry about balance. I don't feel quite the same way. Um, the way I think about balance is, I mean, I have a few different ways of thinking about it, but I'll say with respect to root, uh, if your faction is too strong, um, the primary problem is that the, the choices you make become scripted and obvious, right? So like if, you know, the cats always win by doing a recruit heavy strategy and pushing a dominance. That means that the rest of the cat faction isn't really being engaged. And so like th th that design isn't, isn't fully being engaged. So that's a problem. So it's not really a problem for the other people at the table. It's a problem for the, the cat faction itself. So I often think about like the problem is factions being too weak or strong. It's when they're too boring. Um, and then you kind of w w work around that. I mean, I think when you're dealing with any uh, system that is sufficiently interactive, uh, there are going to be, um, quote, balance problems. It's just because, like, the level of interaction is, um, if you think about the level of interaction as a way that balance can be adjusted, the adjustments that interaction uh, make upon a game are much, much, much more dramatic than the differences between faction A and faction B. There's just no, like, if I can go into your house and just start knocking over shelves and breaking anything, it doesn't Do really it. matter. Yeah, it doesn't, like, it does, it does, like, the, you know, our, our, you know, ability to collect games and you can do it at a rate a little bit higher and I can do it at a rate a little lower. It doesn't matter if I can go into your house and just start knocking over your shelves, right? And so Root kind of has that, that same thing. Um, so when I'm thinking about balance, though, I'm usually thinking about, um, is the game allowing all of the parts of the design to be engaged? And so this is another uh, test that I do when I'm when I'm working on development is I will read the rules of the game and I'll say, do all these rules need to exist? Is there is there a place where when people are playing optimally, they aren't even exploring this system? Because if that's true, then either we need to cut the system or we need to rebalance the game so the systems are being explored more fully. And that's usually how I kind of approach any kinds of ba balance problems. Interesting. No, that's a really that's a really fascinating answer uh, here with Jokari. Uh, what personally for you is one mechanic that you think Oath could not live without? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so, uh, hmm, okay, let me think about the right way to say this. Uh, I have a playtester who will always um, ask me, um, what is the essential thing that a game is about when he is when he is testing? Um, and I always I hate this question because it forces me to think about my game in a very reductive way. Uh, and for a while, when we were working on Oath, we were having trouble getting the Chancellor Citizen Exile dynamic to work well. And I just came out to, to the playtesting Discord and say, "Look, we have to make the Chancellor Citizen offer work. This is an essential part of the game. The whole game spins around." So for many months, we worked on this dynamic, and I think we got to the place where it is now is really good, where it like. There is a lot of room for good deals and crooked deals, and it's very expressive and interesting. Um, and I thought that that was the essential part of the game, the totally essential part of the game. And what we found is that in some games, it is. But in other games that we play, it's not even mentioned, and the game doesn't feel like it's missing something. Um, so with Oath, the thing that I think the game can't live with without right now is... Um, the card flow. I think that 
the way oaths draft works and the way the card list works in the game is so essential to what the game is. Uh, the cards and oath, as we've developed them, continue to get m stronger and stronger and stranger and stranger. And the way they move through the game where, I mean, you know, oath is a complicated game with a lot of moving parts and systems, but essentially you're going to draw a few cards and then you're going to pick one. And the ones that, you, which is to say, you're going to draft. And the ones you don't pick are as important as the ones you do pick. And uh, every card you play, I mean, you might play a card in the beginning of the game that's going to change the whole shape of the game for you. Um, that, to me, is like one of the essential characteristics about the game because it, you know, Oath is not an asymmetric game in the traditional way at Leader that we talk about asymmetric games. But what I've started to see in playtest reports is people are like, this game is more asymmetric than Root. Because once you have one or two face-up cards, your relationship to the game is so dramatically different than any other player. So in Root, we're all trying to get 30 points. <clears throat> but in Oath, my path to victory might be like sneaking into the Commonwealth using like a, a fake mustache and then playing for the succession condition. And someone else's way of winning is like, you know, raising a giant horde of nomads and storming through the steppe and taking like and building a new kingdom out in the hinterland. These are like radically, radically different games. Uh, and it's made possible because of the way the card flow works in the game. So I feel like that's really the essential part of the, of the design. Well, it's interesting because that element, and I, I don't think you're wrong on that. I think, I, I think that's a really interesting point, but it's, it's strange because the teaching of oath feels <laughs> like it should be, or, or feels like it is easier to teach than root, but it is a harder game to learn than root in a lot of ways, totally. yes. uh, but it is still in prototype, but I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I can see that shifting between now and when it's actually in the core well, box. It's... I think it's partially the nature of the game. But then along with that, one of the criticisms I've heard back after someone has had there, because we've been doing a lot of like Discord plays and stuff in our group, and I've had a few people come back that are, are primed to like that game. And the first experience of it is such a learning game where there's so many different possibilities that you could go down routes you could go to for victory that I always, I always come back and I'm like, the first game, just like in some ways Root, but even more so now, look at it like a game where you're learning the mechanics to what you get to play next time. Because the second, the third, even in our coverage back when it was an earlier print and play prototype, our second game, our third game were hands down more rewarding and better than that first game we played. And oh, it totally. continued to increase in that way because we learned the strategy and started developing, uh, understanding where the path might lead. Um, so, yeah, I... Um... It's funny, people would ask me, like, how hard is Oath? And I'm like, well, it's two root factions, or it's one and a half root factions, which is, strictly speaking, true. It's true. It's not that bad. I mean, like, and, and even as we're, we're taking it through usability passes right now, um, Jesse, and, like, so we, like, the player boards look so much cleaner, the cards look so much cleaner, like, the text is getting bigger, there are fewer words, like, we're doing all those steps. And that's always part of the process. And yet, mm -hmm. like I, I can, I feel very comfortable teaching oath. But back when I taught you, I, I think it was uh, a little on the rocky side. I mean, it, it, the, the first few teachers I had were like, "Oh boy, this is a, this is just so much happening." I've gotten pretty good at teaching it, but when you start playing the game, there's no one holding your hand. And and th this is, I think, a characteristic of a bunch of my games. And I don't say this is like I'm not wearing this as a badge of honor, but my weird um, mechanics last design approach means that experienced gamers are often going to feel uncomfortable when they play my games because the things that they can do in a normal game may not work. So like, there's just, even though the, the games themselves, I don't, I mean, so people use Premiere as an example of this, but I think tra uh, this game I did on the Opium Wars called Infamous Traffic is probably the best example of this. The rules for Infamous Traffic are very, very simple. It's just not that complicated of a game, but it doesn't really share any mechanisms with any other game. And so it's very hard to learn. <laughs> and uh, John Company is quite is quite s similar to that. And I think there is a there is a bit of that in Oath, where uh, no one is going to help you win. And in fact, the joy of Oath is, for me is, and I'll usually tell this to people. I'll say, look, when you start this game, you aren't going to know how to win. You'll have no idea how to win. That is the best thing I can give you. You know, you figuring out how to win is what the game is actually all about and starting to like imagine the other ways that you might be able 
to win and building risk into your strategy and seeing how those different stories interact. Like that's the fun of the game. And you just can't get there in a single play. And so one of the one of the bets uh, when I was when I was pitching this game to the studio, I don't think I've actually told the story. When I was pitching the game to the studio, um, one of the things I told people is I wanted to make a game that um, that made a bargain. And the bargain it made was um, this game is very easy to set up and tear down. It doesn't take very long. Very easy to set up, um, but it's complicated. You, you like actually need to spend a lot of time thinking about the rules. And so I, it was kind of like the, the, the Gloomhaven bargain was like, you know, Gloomhaven is a complicated game. It takes a lot to set up, uh, but it's got all this, all this replayability. There are all these systems in it. And a lot of game design, especially in the midweight category is about making games more approachable and easier to learn. And I want to say, no, 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 look, th this is, this is a game that's a little harder. It's a little harder, and the even though the, the rules aren't that difficult, um, it's going to really challenge how you think about victory and kingmaking and the end of the game and how play works. But the consequence of that is that it's a little hard to learn. And uh, I think that in general, I, I love the, where, where board games are right now, but I do think in general there has been a movement away, to, away from complexity. And it's sad because the, you gain a lot from it. And the example I often use, I, I play a lot of Dota and StarCraft and any kind of those MOBAs. Those games take hundreds of hours to learn. Like it, when I have a, a friend come up to me and say, like, hey, I want to learn how to play StarCraft. You play StarCraft. Teach me how. I said, well, it's going to take like 80 hours. <laughs> like I, I just want to make sure that they really understand what we're getting involved with. If I'm going to teach you how to play this game well. Um, <laughs> and it might take like 10 to get you know comfortable, but like we're looking at like twenty matches. Um, with Oath, I want to make sure this is a game that is rewarding for people who are willing to give it at least three games. So my my general rule is like if you play a game once, don't touch Oath. Oath is just not for you. But if you like digging in, you're gonna play the first time and hopefully you'll be intrigued. And then you'll play that second time, and by the end of the second time, you'll be like, okay, I made plans and executed them. And maybe they didn't work. And then by the third time, when you draw your opening three cards, like to me, the, the opening hand in Oath is one of the most important things because it's, it's like a mini promise you're making. Like the card that you pick, is it's, it has huge implications. And the moment where players really start getting into Oath is when they look at those three cards and they understand what it means for them to pick each of the three different cards. And they're like, okay, and, if I pick this card, I'm going to be like the despised wanderer of this game. If I pick this card, I'm going to be an empire builder. And then they like make that choice and the whole game start, you know, starts flowing out from that. Well, and the, the interesting thing or the exciting thing is some of the people that, that Josh first taught the game to in, in our Discord, he came by and taught a, a kind of groundwork game of, of <laughs> Oath. Uh, we now have a campaign that is progressing every week with a group of people that are dipping back in and playing it. So, I mean, it's it's a lovely game. I can't wait for I can't wait for a copy to show it, up. I have, I have no idea. Um, I don't know if I should say this. But I'm going to say it anyway. I have no idea how well it's going to do. Like there's a very funny, I have a very, like with Root, I was very surprised that Root did as well as it did. Uh, with Oath, I'm like, ooh, this is a weird one. This is a weird boy. This is the strangest game. And if we sell out of the first run and we never do another run of it, it was like I will be happy as a clam. I just want, like, I want the game to exist. I want it to be out there and to find the right people. But like th this, I mean, if, if we're talking about like selfish, like this is a game that I want to play. I want nothing more than in, you know, several months when the game's done and we get our early copies. I want nothing more than to like go off in a cabin with my brothers and some friends and just like play Oath for a week. Well, and a, and a Quackalope, right? Yeah, just and, and maybe, cabin, maybe a Quackalope. Maybe possibly. All right. I'll, and I, I just, I'll be waiting I, I for that want, call. I want that moment. Yeah. And um, I hope that there are enough people uh, out there who want that moment to like, you know, to make it actually happen. But I I just have no idea. I think it is so... All of our games that we do at Leader are like a little out of step with like the best practices of the industry. And so far it's been great for us, but like I wonder if that's going to continue. Well, uh, most of your Leader Games fans are also a little out of step just in right, general. So I, like, so, is so I think you found us? a community. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm hoping that like there are enough of us. But, you know, people will ask me about Oath expansions and like there is room for me to craft additional content for Oath. But what I, what I tend to tell people is like, 
all of Oath, I've behaved as if this will never get reprinted. <laughs> and so, it, it, you know, I, the, the question about the expansion, that's a lovely question to even entertain. But like, I'm, I'm hitting for the fences here because I, I'm thinking I may never get to work on a project this high budget again. And if I'm going to do a like the equivalent of a triple A board game, uh, I, I want to do it on, completely on my own terms, and then I can move on to something else. I told, I told uh, Gates, I'm, I'm working on like a potentially a small box game, and I'm like, this is my oath penance because I think this game is like very likable, and th th this other project I'm working on, which is too early to really talk about in detail, but like it's a very likable, quirky little, little yeah, a likable, quirky little game, and. Uh, it is, it's, it's, it's my, like, it's my refresher after something like Oath. You're, you're, re you're restoring the disruption that you put into the board game space <laughs> through Oath. I, I hear what you're saying. So a question that sort of lines up with that. And again, I'm going to keep hitting on this. I want to respect your time. We're, we're getting even closer to that extra 30 minutes you gave me. So we might start going even faster through these. Okay, sure. Um, let's, let's hit a few. A lot of Oath players critique the win of the chancellor as a luck base dice roll uh will there be changes or is this thematically mandatory uh so good question um i will just say where we are at currently because this is a thing that has changed in the iterations um it used to be that the game would always win on this random uh, it, there'd be a random roll and whoever had the victory condition would win um what we're doing now is that role is only made by the chancellor if the Commonwealth has the victory condition so that if you don't, so like if you don't want the chancellor to win, you need to like tilt the state a little bit. This gives players a little bit more, more control um, and allows the, the chancellor is the one who's trying to survive. But if, if, you know, we actually just had a game in the studio right now that ended on, on a, a turn five roll and the exiles made a decision not to take the oath from the chancellor, knowing that this might mean that the game was going to be over. So it was a calculated risk. That's how it happened. And if you feel bad about it, set up and play the, the next generation because you'll be able to settle that score. Um, one of the things that we did do, though, is because the chancellor used to win on default on the eighth turn. Um, that's gone and it's been replaced by a victory priority that makes it possible for exiles to win on visions on the very last turn of the game. And that disrupts some of the luck that the chancellor would just try to like hold on till the end. Uh, because we, we did want, I, I do want it to feel like when you win, like I don't want players to feel like they stumble into a win, which sometimes happens in true in oath, like a win is seized. Um, but I, I do think that like having that role is a very important part of the design because it is an amount of risk that the exiles have to build into their plans. And that's an important feature of the design. Yeah, interesting. Uh, following up on that question, someone responded, a lot of players critique Oath. Can you ignore them? Oh, yeah. No, I'm really <laughs> um, I, know, I know you personally are one of the most critical parts of your own design process. Oh, yeah, no, I, so look, no one hates game. my stuff as much as I do, so don't worry. Um, I, I didn't like Root until, like, a month before it was at the factory. <laughs> um, I, and I, it wasn't that it was bad, it just, I wasn't into it. And it was funny, I remember um, my, my, my brother, you know, so... My whole family, we, we, love, we love making things and we love critiquing things. And I remember after Root had funded, after it was like mostly through development in February of that year, I played a game of, of Root with Drew. And I remember Drew looking at me and being like, this ain't it, is it? This just isn't good. And it was like, Drew, we raised half a million dollars. Uh, no, no. And, and he was right. He was right to say that. I um, So I read everything written that I can find written about the games that I work on. And I don't do this out of ego. I do this to sharpen my own sense of self-criticism. I actually think, you know, uh, in in writing and anything, there's this notion that we all have these like inner voices telling us that we're bad at things. And generally, uh, that's thought of as a bad thing. You don't want to be self-critical. You know, you do wonderful work, feel good, self-esteem, et cetera. And I think that's true. But on the other hand, those little voices inside your head that are telling you you're not doing what you're doing isn't good enough. You want to keep those voices well fed. This is like, that's your taste. Like trying to tell you like, Hey, I think you can do better than this. So I, um, I've always felt like on the one hand, um, you know, uh, creation is hard. Don't beat yourself too much about it. You know, know that your personal worth as a human being isn't tied to your creative work. 
On the other hand, if you want to make good things, you do need to beat yourself up about them. And like, that's a really important part of just like what it means to make something good is to be constantly tearing it down. I mean, I have, so like in Oath, the combat system in Oath um, is very powerful and robust and it's a fancy piece of design work, but I've never quite been happy with it. And so I constantly am rebuilding it and I've never been able to build a better version, but it's like one of the parts of the design that I'm like, I think I can do this better. And I'll like, I'll, you know, I'll jump into it. Uh, and I, so far I haven't been able to, to, to figure out a way through, but I, I actually, um, I do my best to read everything that's written, especially the negative comments. Because, uh, you know, I want to get ahead of them. I want to see what people don't like about it and see if that is uh, – and it's not like – I'm not trying to design by committee. The way I think about it is I read a negative comment, and then I'll say, D are they – is this negative critique – is it enunciating something that I've felt but haven't been able to put into words? And if, it, if that's true, then there's something I can learn from it. So it's not about making them happy. It's about them helping me understand my own inclinations about a design. We do a, we do a similar thing in a way on Quackalope from a media perspective is we spend a lot of time trying to analyze what we've done, what we've put out, and how the community has responded to it, whether that's through engagement, likes, comments. Uh, and Jan, Jan always says that I'm – I'm stubborn enough that I, I sit there and I read the thing and I reject it immediately and, and will argue against it. And then a week later, he'll see me make changes because of or in sure. response to it, because it is it is oftentimes sometimes it's not. But oftentimes there's elements there that you can identify or recognize or have been feeling. And they those comments show that those things that you are concerned about, the community might be noticing as well. And so maybe you need to give it a closer look. Um, and that happens both in design and in creation and media content, and then also just in kind of personal relationships in life. It's a, it is, I think, a rewarding system and a rewarding personality trait to be willing to look at criticisms that some people have. There, there is a talk by, it's a talk or a TED talk or P, I don't know, about I, uh, that, that uh, Ira Glass gave. And it, it's about um, creation and also the importance of taste and creation. And how, like, you know, when you start making something, your technique is horrible. Uh, and you should expect your technique to be horrible. And so as you develop your technique, you should also be developing your taste, your ability to, like, judge the good from the bad. And so when I see people critique uh, the work I've done, I'm, I'm grateful for it because I think it it enables me to develop my own taste. And sometimes I, re I re reject the critique and think, okay, like, you guys are playing this wrong. Or you're not, you know, this is the, the thing about the sit up and shut, the sit up and shut, the shut up and sit down vi video review of Root is that they were compelled by the game, but they kept finding it was like very flat. And actually, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on Quinn's for a second, only because I like him. Um, he made a comment. I so this is like, I listened to everything. I saw that they, uh, they reviewed Pamir. Uh, on their podcast. And I was like, oh, interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll listen to it. And they, they said a very interesting thing. Um, Quinn said that he felt like my games were amusement park rides that promised to be really cool and interesting, but are sort of on rails once you get started. And I heard that comment and I was like, that's crazy. How could you say that? My, these are like the most sandboxy open designs like out there. Where's this coming from? And so I reacted very strongly. I was like, he's crazy wrong. He's like totally wrong. Um, and then I thought about it more. And I think what he was saying was, if you lose, like, you know, if, if it's like watching hockey. If you can't, if you're not used to it, you have trouble seeing where the puck is. Once you lose where the puck is, it's hard to follow the action of the game. And so I, I think what, what he was saying, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, is that in a lot of designs I've worked on, if one player gets behind and not behind, but like if they, if they get out of the victory race, if they stop understanding what's happening in the action of the game, there's no on ramp. There's no way to get back in because like there might be ways in terms of victory to get back in, but if you lose the narrative thread, you're done. And I heard that and I thought that's very true. And I don't care because actually like, that high rope, that that high wire tension is something I really like in my design. And I like the fact that like they are open, but as a player, I, I, I'm demanding of my players. I'm like, if you're going to play this game, I need you to invest and to be creative and to think about your way through. I am not going to be creative for you. Yeah, interesting. Um, and, and so like that's just, you know, one little idea of how I'm going to process someone's negative comment. 
So I believe I have I have two more sort of Hit larger me. questions, and then I want to do like a a ten second per answer so that I can make okay. sure we we briefly touch on all the people. I all the promise. Questions people have. I promise to give you ten second answers. You're good. No, you're good. I again. I'm doing this only because I'm trying to respect your time so I can have you back some other time. That's my yes. whole strategy. I'll Perfect. let you in on that. Uh, so uh, so Jutlander has a larger question, and this is a guy that's actually, I believe, from the Woodland Warriors page. Okay, um, when I first saw the, the, Wood, the Underworld expansion, I initially realized that those two new factions were different from the rest. In a way, they were mostly characterizations of what the animals they represented are. Moles did tunnels, crows do conspiracies. While all, all other factions were based on more abstract archetypes, eagles and pride, raccoons and being vagabonds, if even that. But then I saw it in more detail and I realized that, for example, the moles follow this sort of private enterprise of conquest, very similarly to what the Spanward, Spaniards did in America, where they would come privately and settle. Uh, as they were successful, the crown and the nobles would help them more. So my question is. Was this a part of the design process to give these two new factions more historical depth and take them out of just being animals doing their things? Mm -hmm. Have you thought about other historical uh, institutions or events that could lead to new root factions? The obvious example here is the steeps invading or the steps invading. Mm -hmm. but, it, but but do you poss possibly have more in mind? So um, <clears throat> that's a very astute comment. Um, Patrick, when he designs... Um, I think he likes to, you know, moles dig. So Patrick, if he's going to build a mole faction, is going to um, sort of build it around like the more media and naturalistic component of the animal adaptation. I tend to work a little on the metaphorical side. And so during the course of development, I essentially like tried to pull the moles and build more of a thematic logic. But I think the moles are more grounded in the naturalistic like one-to-one -one metaphor. And the same is probably true of the crows as well. This is just a, a difference of approach. Um, when I'm working, I'm, I'm thinking of looser animal archetypes and like general, like usually what happens is I'll, I'll tell Kyle or someone, Hey, I have this faction of like uh, squabbling nobles. And then uh, Kyle draws some animals. And I'm like, those birds look pretty noble. I think there's like, there is something to like that. And it isn't like, well, birds have, nests and they get into turmoil no it's like it, it isn't it's never that one-to-one -one with me with patrick i think he likes that connection to the animal world a little bit more than i do and so the fact that the crows and the the duchies show that more i think reflects patrick's process um and i actually to that point i have geopolitical uh positions that i'm working on for the new root factions i don't know what animals are going to be yet that's like a conversation for after. Oh, fascinating. Uh, like I, I talked to Kyle a little bit more and figure out what, what are some good pairings for these. these because things. I've heard, and we won't dive into this, this is a whole conversation <laughs> that I can either have, have with Kyle or have with both of you down the road. But I have listened again to, to Heavy Cardboard's uh, conversation with you where you talk and touch on the integration and how you bring Kyle into the design process from a very sure. early stage. Um, and I find that whole dynamic uh, fascinating and, and wonderful. It's like, well. it's like really important to, I think it's important to enfranchise Kyle in the design process because he's interested in design and because he is the, he is the critical member of the storytelling team. We had a funny thing happen when we um, uh, started working with Magpie to produce the root RPG where um, the root RPG folks, uh, who are a great team, they would ask me for permission about like a thematic thing they wanted to do. And it took a while for me to be like, no, you have to talk to Kyle as much as me or more, because like, this is Kyle's world. We're all building it together. And, and they were thinking of him as like just an illustrator. And it took a moment for, to, for the, us to get on the same page and for us to be like, no, this is a creative team. And uh, I think the with the structures he puts in place through the artwork that he does. I mean, I've watched some of his live stream where he talks about his thought process and developing and, and is just as critical of his work as I think a lot of the people in the leader yep. games team are. Uh, he's he's remarkable. I, I honestly genuinely I want to get an interview scheduled with Kyle. I want to get an interview scheduled with Patrick. I want to get an interview scheduled with Gates. I mean, yeah. the, the, the roster you all have on your team is I mean, it's outstanding. Oh. Yeah, we have, we have a great team. It is so much like I, I cannot, I love going to work every day. It's great. Yeah. Uh, we have a good team. All right. Give me your other question. Yep. 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 So 
Uh, currently, Whirly Gig Games is focused on rebooting a lot of Cole's uh, earlier games uh, as he works on new designs with Leader Games. Are there any future plans for designs under Whirly Gig? And what does the future of that brand look like? So um, I love the fact that I've got this weird side company with my brother, both because I love working with Drew. Um, he is wonderful. We've always worked together really well. And uh, when we started this company, we were like, oh, you know, family companies, he's always in badly. Uh, or it's, you know, maybe it's going to turn into an, an AMC drama or something. Um, I that. And, 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 and so um, we worked on it. And at the end of doing Premiere, we had a, we had a meeting where I said like, okay, is this, do you want to keep doing this? And he was like, oh yes, this was super fun. Let's keep doing it. And then he ended up, he, he, he quit his job. At the Chicago, he had a great job at the Chicago Botanic Garden that he left to do Whirly Gig full time. So it's like, it's going really well. Um, I like it because it allows me to do two things. It allows me to continue doing historical game design, which is like my favorite type of game design. Um, and it allows me, that's thing one, two, it allows me to really own the um, the things that we make. This is a really important, so this is another thing that gets sometimes buried about Leader Games. The structure of the Leader Games company is such that um, I don't take a root royalty. I kind of do, but it's more like a distributed bonus that if Root does well, like Gates does well at marketing and like Nick does well in development, even though like they weren't there when we designed Root. It doesn't matter. Um, so the way I tend to think about it is like there's a trust that all of our projects go into. And if Fort goes bananas, it'll be very good for for the designer, Grant, and it, uh, it'll probably be good for Nick, but it's also going to be good for everybody. And so we really try thinking about like what does a really egalitarian like equity based model for game production look like? I want artists and creators to own as much of their content as they possibly can. And I think one of the beautiful things about the the landscape we're in right now is that if you have people you trust and if you have a willingness to learn a lot of other skills like graphic design this is a, whenever i talk to normal uh to junior designers i always tell them teach yourself how to do graphic design because you don't need to rely on other people you can be more of your a one-stop shop and so i uh so really gig is my own way of like trying to own those titles and uh we have our work full for the next couple of years probably uh getting john company second edition out and doing infamous traffic second edition uh we're also working on an upcoming game about american reconstruction and we have a couple other projects that we want to do as well. So we do want to do new titles, but history games take a really long time to do. You just can't rush uh, research. In fact, I had a lovely message uh, today from someone who follows my work who's going to put me in contact with a bunch of history professors who work on reconstruction, who I want to talk to about this. You know, I'm going to have those chats. We're going to have interviews. I'm going to need follow-up chats. And this is all way before I think about, like, what does the game even look like? Um, so it'd be my hope that we do John Company for next year and maybe also Infamous Traffic, depending on how fast John Company goes. And then the year after that, we'll start doing new stuff. Awesome. All right. Let's sprint. If you don't mind, let's sprint. I'm ready to sprint. Uh, so, so exciting. I love, I'd love to know Cole's thoughts on Amazon's Prime series, series The Expanse. I haven't seen it. Okay. Um, well, all I know about, yeah, yeah. Uh, all I know about The Expanse is somebody made a dope pax premiere full conversion called pax expanse that is so good i am deeply honored by it um and it looks awesome and it makes me want to watch the show fair enough i'll have to check out both of those things now uh as a root player i'd love to know which new faction he is planning on adding to the game any any future factions you can um, talk about so uh i'll just quickly uh, uh th theocracy divided government uh, i want to do another spin on an invading force that has to like make promises like, Hey, we're going to conquer this stuff. Can we have these resources? And then if you fail to do that, there are ramifications. I also have a weird secret society that allows you to uh, share control of everybody else's warriors. Cool. Sounds, sounds very cool. Uh, a, a question posed by Crimson, Crimson Goon. Is there a potential for a root sequel? Has that been discussed actually separating it from the core? Um, no, we're not going to do that because, uh, I'll just say on the business side, you want one entry point into like a world. Uh, and so like having a route two, the best case you do is you cut the sales of route one. So we're not going to do that. What we might do is Patrick has an open world adventure game called path and actually roots world was, was built on path. Path is an older game. We might, after route is done, explore the world with other products, but we're probably not going to do a route two. Interesting. Yeah, that makes sense from a from a business side as well. Uh, Root, what 
I uh, already asked this one. Root versus Oath. Do you consider Oath campaigns more influenced by player decision than battle systems in Root, hence less RNG? Uh, why is Root so limited in the cards that affect battles? Brutal Tactics, Partisans, oh, that's and yet question. they come up with a price beyond crafting. Um, that is a, that's a great question. So um, the answer is that the Root battle system does everything that I... So like the Root battle system is fairly um, expressive, but it's not very easy to expand without tilting a lot of the math and making it entirely about cards so that it's just not a place where cards can influence it very much. Uh, that's kind of a, 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 a little bit of a drafty answer, but that, that's, that, that, that's the, the reason why. Um, Oath, it's weird. Oath has less random elements, sort of. <laughs> like, the, 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 there, there are parts of Oath that are... Uh, Oath is a more chaotic game than Root in general. Um, but in terms of, like, the micro levels of chaos, uh, you find a lot less. Like, you're not rolling doubles, although that can happen. So I think I think uh, maybe it's fair to say that it comes out in the wash, and they're both probably about as random. I think Root is more tactically random, and Oath is more strategically random, which is weird because Root is a much more tactical game than Oath. Oath is way more strategic. You do a lot more long-term planning. Interesting. Uh, here with Oath, do you have a favorite suit of denizens, and which role, Chancellor, Citizen, or Exile, is most enjoyable for you to play? I love playing as citizens. I love it. I, I love being a citizen and then exiling and then being a citizen again. Um, I want I want in and out. I want the complicated relationship. Favorite suit right now is probably order. Um, the theme of order is powers that affect you when you rule. So we have a card right now called the Secret Police, which is players can't draw cards when they're in places that you rule. So what ends up happening is if you have order cards, they just give the map such color because you know like, oh, I can't can't go to Jesse's kingdom because I can't draw cards there because he has a secret police. So you like find yourself like running outside of the gates of Jesse's kingdom, doing stuff and leading insurrections in. Uh, many of those order powers are really fun and I've, I've enjoyed developing them. So I have a question here. Uh, how was it working with Phil Ookland? Uh, Eklund, yeah. Eklund. I'll, again, I assume that I make everything, every Sure, sure, sure. You're good. Uh, and then it, it says, who has uh, interesting worldviews? Yeah, so he, um, I really love Phil. He's a, a wonderful person who comports himself online in ways that I think are a little backwards. And I, I think, unfortunately, they don't... Um, they don't reflect well. Uh, uh, so they don't reflect well on his generosity as a person. He is a generous collaborator and a generous person. He's always been involved in like in re refugee movements, and he's been very. Um, I would think I think about Phil as a genuinely good person with political feelings that I disagree with. And those I can think, exist. What are you talking? I about? know. I know. Impossible. We live, so we live in a time when people are very like, if someone disagrees with you, you have to kick them out of your life. I, I fundamentally think that's a bad way of conducting politics. I think that I, I, like my position is I want to convince you of my own political stance. I really believe in not political hobbyism, but like an active political engagement. And I, I think nobody has to be friends with anyone else. If you don't like someone, don't be friends with them. My goodness. It's not your job to educate someone else at the same time. Like, um, I love argument and Phil is a person who I've always liked arguing with in person. Mm. Um, we're working with him. He's a great collaborator. Uh, and it was, it's, I, I had a lot of fun work working with him. I am glad that I have my own gig now because it allows me to exercise some of the creative choices that I couldn't do when I was working within his model. But, uh, we still love each other and respect each other. Uh, despite the fact that I'm going to argue with him every time I see him in person, I'll say one thing about, he lives in Germany. I don't see him very much in person, but when we were at origins, um, we, we had lunch and we had like a five hour political argument at lunch and it was great. <laughs> I, I personally think politics should just never exist online. It's one of those things where a sit down, because here's the thing, ideas, ideas are valuable across the board. I like the opportunity to sit down and debate and dig into why people believe with something, but you can't do that the same way online as you can during a five hour conversation. And I'm not scared of, if you're informed in your own opinions enough, you shouldn't be scared of other ideas because you should be able to sit down and have that discussion. We're going to keep pushing though, uh, from uh, Wait, can I say one little thing before you push yeah. again? Uh, everybody should read this brilliant book by Eaton Hirsch called um, Politics is for Power, which is entirely about political argument and hobbyism. It's the best book on politics I've read in years. Everyone should read it. All right. Now you can All ask right. me your question. 
we're, question. We're getting there. We're, 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 we're almost done. What do you think of there being fan-made free TTS versions of Root in terms of intellectual property and all of that? And the same thing could be said for any of the other games that have been modded onto TTS. Um our lawyer is going to kill me for saying this, but information just wants to be free. I mean, I like, I, I like it. I think it's good. I, uh, in fact, I, here's how much I like it. Uh, Drew and I have made the decision that all Whirly gig releases will be in the creative commons under a, um, a share, a non-commercial license. So that as long as you're not selling it, you can use our files, you can build mods, you can do whatever the heck you want. You can remix it. I don't care. I think that like, um, th th this is the way, like, uh, in like, uh, intellectual property laws, uh, hurt innovation because they block access. And I, I, so I, I but at the same time, you want to protect livelihood. I think the creative commons is an excellent space. Oath would not exist. I mean, not oath, uh, PAX wouldn't exist without the access to the public domain because most of the art in the game is in the public domain because it's sure. all... 19th century art uh, for oath. What, what we've essentially decided to do is just to like put it up on TTS. And if you want to play it, you can just play it. Um, and we're, we're going to do our best to maintain print and plays. Um, I, you know, th this isn't, this isn't always like the commercially correct thing to say, but I, I feel pretty strongly that, you know, and, that and this is available. your opinion. This is your position. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Not speaking Spe for speaking anyone, individual. anyone speaking beyond as an individual and only for my own company. Uh, yeah. I, I think that, you know, so, for instance, one thing I'll say about Root, um, we actually have limits to the kinds of apps that we can officially sanction because of our agreement with Direwolf for their digital adaptation. Which looks so, incredible. It looks incredible. And it, so, so if somebody comes to me and say, hey, I built a really cool digital online app, I'm going to do my best to pretend that I didn't see it. <laughs> Right, because I, I don't want to have to take down all their hard work, you know, all that stuff. But, um, you know, as an enterprise grows, things become legally a little more complicated. Personally, I want people to have access to all these games. Well, and I, and that, I, yeah. I'd had that conversation with with Adam from Kingdom Death before, you know, way, way early on. And his stance is always, I just don't know anything about it, period. I have no I have no sense of it. And then but it also comes at a time where we see Asmodee going through. And I think probably from a legal side, having to uh, copyright and bring down everything that is yeah. fan made and some of those scripts were incredible uh which is why we still have them saved on our personal computers uh that's besides <laughs> the point uh what is your favorite game you've made and why is it pax premiere <laughs> my favorite game is in fact pax premiere i um oh i don't even know why is it pax premiere i just love it it's it um it does all the things that I wanted it to do so well, and it like is the most in tune with like my group and their taste. Like I just I love that it formalizes uh, the the diplomatic rearrangements of the game that you actually there is diplomatic inertia. You can't just change your alliance willy nilly. Um, I think it is very strategic. It scales really well. Um, it's just it is the one most well suited when my brother uh my youngest brother blake when he was staying with us while we were finishing premiere he and my wife and i played premiere like every other night for months and months and it was just it, it was so fun i love i love it i think um all the other games I, I think oath might be coming to tie it but i'll probably always have a, a special place in my heart for premiere all right i believe we're down to the last three so okay fire away. uh let's see here what game do you personally enjoy playing the most, whether it's from your design or sort of a broader scope? Uh, great question. I love, ooh, okay, uh, probably 1889. That's my go-to. I love 1889. Um, a lot of Dune lately. Been playing a lot of Dune. And then uh, high player count diplomacy games. Staff diplomacy games where you've got like two players per faction. Mm. I'm going to be self. I'm going to be selfish again real quick. If there was one game you'd like to see come to Quackalope in the next like six months, what would it be? Oh my gosh. Uh, I'm not sure what would be a good one for you guys. I don't know. Have you guys, have you guys done, uh, have you gotten, I don't know. The problem is streaming 18 XX games is not good. They're just like a little too long. I'm not asking crunching. logistically. I'm saying if you could pick one game for me to figure out and dive into somehow, mm. what would you, what would you tell me to put some effort behind? You should figure out how to do, do diplomacy. I think that there is a world of like the reality show format for the classic game diplomacy that would be beautiful, like chef's kiss beautiful. Okay. And it, it would require some creativity and you guys are the right outlet to tackle it because it's a brilliant game. 
I'll start thinking about it. Uh, you need Nicole a confession, Hutchinson. Cam. That's going to be a critical <laughs> element. Of this sounds good. I think we could do that. I think we could figure that out. Is there anything that would that you would have liked to add to Oath, but just couldn't? I would have loved to add a more uh, detailed uh, combat system. I really wanted it. I wanted like a like a um, uh, We the People or like Hannibal Rome versus Carthage like combat system that felt like you were playing out a bunch of battles, but we couldn't do it because the thing about Oath is that there's all this stuff happening in the game and the campaign system is built the way it is so that you can resolve it in basically like 30 seconds. Hmm. So battles and oath have to be 30 seconds because there's a lot that happens in the game. And if we want it, that's kind of why campaign is so complicated because there's a weird trade where if I made it less complicated, it would be longer. And so I, part of me is like, I want, and actually oath used to have this very complicated, very fun battle system that is in fact, it's just own game. And so I, I had to fork it off and everybody in the staff like really liked it. But it was like it took it took five minutes to play a battle. It was like not going to happen. So maybe we'll do a battles expansion or something. For the, so I believe for from course. looking, this is the the last question that I'm going to say thank you to you and, and have you hang up quickly. Uh, last question here. Will we be getting a more effect heavy third deck? What are your thoughts on bringing heroes slash leaders to the root factions? And then thank you, Cole, for this gem of a game. Oh, well, I appreciate it. Um, are there going to be heroes for the factions? Probably not because I don't. Uh, my least favorite expansion for Twilight Imperium was the Leaders expansion, and it was because it looked awesome, but it was just kludgy. So probably not Heroes and Leaders. Um, more factions that have only one, like maybe a remixed uh, Vagabond, or more factions that only have one piece. Possible. Uh, we've got some ideas on that front, um, and then a third deck, uh, maybe. Um, that Partisan actually, deck is so good. Thank you. It's my favorite thing that I did, that I did like last year. Uh, it was. I think it's um, the one element of root right now that that I well I will play without it if it's a new group of players. But it's the one stand. I, I, I demand. That I'll we play with it every, every time. Period. I, I demand that we put it in every game. I um, uh, we actually have a long-standing uh, kind of argument, a low-key argument in a studio whether or not we should do another root deck. And I'm like, I don't know if there are enough effects. And then Nick is like. Psh, I can make one that has more effects. So, uh, so maybe, maybe it happens. I just, I really like it so much that I just like kind of want it to be like the tournament standard, but uh, it's the sort of thing that I will, what, what we'll do is eventually someone is going to make a Google doc and then we're going to start populating it with card effects. And pretty soon it's like, you know, we've got enough here for a deck and then, for, and then it'll enter testing. For me, the compelling thing or the bridge of it is, it utilizes other factions mechanics in a really interesting yeah. way. It gives you powers that other players potentially have. And so not only I think mechanically and structurally, it fits so well into the core of the game, but it also thematically for me is as if I'm in a living world to even another degree, because mm -hmm. I might, if I'm the birds, I might be able to talk a mole into letting me go through a tunnel or I yeah. might be able to, to have a shop and do a swap meet. And it, it, it did a thing that, that Kyle, so this is like a good place for our creative process, where um, one of the things that bummed Kyle out about Root was that he didn't get to draw the faction guys that much. So he spent all his time on the character design for the factions. But then most of the art in the game is the denizens of the woods. Yeah. And so he's like, I wish I could have drawn more cats. I wanted to draw more birds. Um and so w w with the Exiles and Partisans deck, I was like, okay, well, how about, and then like that, that, that project kind of like spun out of that desire for like more cat drawings uh, weirdly. And that's, you know, the, how, that's how our weird process works. That's how most of the internet works. So on that note, on a strong desire for more uh, cat drawings, which, which I'm a little frustrated by because I think duck should be included in nearly everything. I, uh, yeah, well, I want to, I want to very personally <laughs> I want to very personally thank you for for taking the time to um, to step back both from from me, from Quackalope, and then also from from the fans. I mean, a lot of people you were I posted on the Patreon the very first interview we did. And I think I screenshotted you the the text response where I was like, I told people, who would you like me to talk with? Uh, and you were, you know, above and beyond one of the most requested people listed well, there. And you. I didn't expect you to say yes as quickly as you did. So we're still a ragtag operation. <laughs> will be highly improved when I convince you to come back on, but really um, seriously, thank you. This was, this was my pleasure and I'm happy to give you whatever answers you'd like long, short, everywhere in between. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jesse. I will see you for the next one.